Yo, yeah. Reese, um, we got a little free, a, f- a few questions. Yeah, go about on, bring it to me, bro. I'll bring it to me, homie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, what I wanted to ask you is like, obviously, you went up there and you, you saw it was a completely different experience from down here. What would be the comparisons? I think uh, one of the first comparisons, boxing wise, mm. is um, when you're boxing in Ecuador and you're boxing in, you know, Panama and you're in Venezuela, all these phases for the Pan American Games, the first realization you come to is that you're seeing the more Hispanic style. Yeah. And obviously, as this Pan American game, all the Caribbean islands are there, all the Latino countries are there, America and Canada are there. So you're now seeing all the styles on the Americas there. Right. Argentina was over there. So um, getting more prepped to that style, you see in the Hispanics, they roll their head more. They come up with their head a lot. Okay. Especially the shorter Hispanic fighters. And then you'll find, what I find with a lot of them, what they do, they, um, they have to get you trapped in the corner, they have to settle down, right. keep you there. Right. So that's what I noticed about the Hispanic fighters. Then you had the Dominican fighters from the Dominican Republic. I found that the Dominican Republic fighters was very crossed between the African-American slick style and very still the Mexican type style with it, where they roll with the head. Mm. So they, it was very blended. And I found that in Venezuela, the, the fighters from Venezuela, right. they were fighting in spurts. So what they would do, they would wait, they would relax, but then mm. double jab, uppercut, straight right hand and hook. Mm. They would double jab, uppercut hook, or they'd throw two hooks. Mm. So um, it was real, you know, contrasting with the styles. And okay. what, I think what makes these competitions so great is the fact that you're seeing so much mixed variety of styles. So when it comes to, say, the Olympics now, you are going to see so much diverse styles and you see the best of each style come out. Mm. So you're going to see the movers, you're going to see the aggressive fighters, you're going to see the left hookers, you're going to see the um, the stand-up European style fighters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, with all the styles I've seen in the Commonwealth Games and with the Africans and the certain Caribbeans and the Asian fighters, like the Indian and Pakistani fighters, right. it's going to be even more contrasting, especially when I was in Ecuador than when I was in Panama, it's going to be very contrasting when in Azerbaijan for the world, because you're now seeing all the best of the world, everyone's trying to qualify for the Olympics, because they're going to use the world as a stepping stone, and as a part of the qualification period for the Olympics. Mm. So it's, it's very contrasting, because you're now going to see the Europeans, the Africans, the Caribbeans, you're going to see all fighters from the Americas, you're going to see all those contrasting styles, and you're also going to see, you know, you're going to represent whichever country, selected country you're from yeah. with your style. Yeah. And then one of the crazy parts is you're seeing all these styles yeah. and not only are you seeing all these styles but you're going to, um, these are the guys you may see in the Olympics. Right. Because everyone's trying to use that as a qualification period. <laughs> so okay. I think, and what it does, it steps up your boxing IQ. I mean, since the Commonwealth Games, my boxing IQ has gone up just through the roof. Wow. I'm, I'm real good at picking mistakes. I'm real good at seeing styles. I'm one of those guys. I don't even need to watch an opponent. Yeah. I can just play my opponent right there when I'm in that ring. Yeah. You know, it takes me like 30 seconds or to, to work out a fight and his moves. Yeah. But then at this level of boxing, I'm at the same way it takes me 30 seconds to figure you out. It could take another man 20 or another man 15. Right. So that's the kind of level we're at now. You know, it's like being at the Premiership and then passing the Premiership and being in the Champions League. And this is the stage we're at now. Mm. You know, we're now stepping into the Champions League. Right. Okay. Um, Would you say um, it was a very disciplined environment? I mean, Um, nutrition-wise, I could say, obviously, obviously fitness-wise. Usually, these environments are very disciplined for nutrition, but because due to the circumstances in Panama, <laughs> there was a lot of... Uh, I, I don't think everyone was nutritionally focused. Yeah. Because we had issues with the accommodation, we had issues with where we're getting our food. Mm. Some of us had to pay for our own food. Yeah. You know, it was real... Um, it was real funny, the situations in Panama. But, you know, when you go to these games, you're looking at the athletes from all over the world because you're seeing runners, swimmers you're looking at their diets you're looking at why they eat that particular type of food for their diet mm. and as you get understandings of why they do certain things and why they eat certain foods yeah it helps you do an analogy a lot better on yeah. the type of food you should eat yeah 
So sometimes you're talking to athletes who understand um, dieting, who understand nutrition very well, and as you're listening to them, it helps you plan your meals a lot better. Okay. So I think that's the art of an athlete, you know, because they say now nah, there's more than 60% of, you know, 60% of being an athlete is mm. to do with your nutrition. Right, okay. And what you consume as, a, as an athlete. Okay, well, a personal question, how would your nutrition be at this moment? Well, at the moment, I've taken things to another level in the space of a whole year, and I'm learning so much more, I'm doing so much more to apply my nutrition and apply the nutrition with the performance. You know, um, what I've done leading up to um, Panama, I was studying a lot of foods which are good for recovery. And I realized in Panama, all I had to do was in my fights was take a quick breather and in sparring, and I found I was recovering a lot faster with the interval training, with the sprint training, with, I weren't doing per se long runs, but I was doing a lot of um, medium duration runs where your heart rate is working for the whole period while you're running. Yeah. So I was working a lot out of my comfort zone. Hmm. I was eating a lot of foods which were good for recovery. I was drinking a lot more coconut water, which has natural electrolytes, which keep you hydrated mm. and helps replenish your body with the salts which has been lost. Right. So um, I can say that I learned a lot on those grounds because I was um, really taking things to another level. It was a real experimental stage of the dieting. So now, as the worlds are coming up and Panama's coming up, there's so much more diet-wise that I'm going to apply to add to the arsenal. Okay. Um, was you surprised of the high standards of the other boxers that nah, were there? No. Nah. Nah? Because I understood everybody wanted to be there in Mexico. I understood that if I want to be there, I have to step up and everyone else is stepping up. Okay. So you're in an arena with gladiators that are hungry. Mm. So no, nah, I wasn't surprised. Okay. Um, we will conclude this. I'm going in my moment. We will right. conclude this um, for, for our part two. We'll see you soon.